in our current prospects for Ukraine, we have to follow Ukraine. Ukraine is, like it or not, the, you know, the future of the liberal world order, and we need to follow it here on Think Tech, here on Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, and the handsome young man is Carl Baker. Uh, he is a senior advisor, Pacific Forum, and it's very important that we check in with him from time to time um, to get connected with global events. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me again. And uh, it's another time to update uh, what's happening with Ukraine and how it's impacting the rest of the world, because it certainly is uh, is is a key event in in a lot of different in a lot of different ways. You know, I like to think that uh, over nine months of war now, people get more interested rather than le less interested. But I guess that's not the way humanity works. For myself, I've been fascinated. I, I, I uh, I've been watching a series of lectures by your, your colleague, Tim Snyder, who mm -hmm. teaches a course at Yale in this, and he makes his lectures, I guess it's a Yale thing, he makes his lectures public. And uh, his lecture, you know, it's about Ukraine, it's about everything that ever happened in Ukraine from way back when to try to explain, you know, the, the potpourri of culture and historical vectors that exist in Ukraine. Um, and you really, you know, it's just mind blowing to find all the trouble, all the trouble they've seen over the years. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's really a, a very, very volatile spot in, in Europe. And, you know, when you look at where Ukraine sits, it's, it's, it's right there. You know, it's, it's the, it's sort of, sort of the, the, the definition of, of Russia versus, versus the West. And, and that's how it's playing out right now. Yeah. So it's war and uh, another war in Europe except somehow this one's different. Uh, somehow this one affects the United States more perhaps, and certainly affects uh, Western Europe. And of course, history is dynamic. It's dynamic in two ways. Uh, you know, one way is what's going on at Ukraine affects Europe and what's going on in Europe affects Ukraine. And both sides of that equation are dynamic and moving all the time. And although you know we are fascinated and distracted with all the political you know, machinations here in the United States, um, it is probably a bigger news story to find out how the liberal world order is doing and where it's going. So um, you know, I listed in, in writing up this show, I listed a bunch of factors and and uh, you know considerations and influences on what's going on for the invasion. But I know that's only some. There, there are many more under the surface. And we can't possibly get a handle on all of them, but let's try. Um, so what, what is making the war last this long? And how is the war going, Carl? Well, I think the war is going toward a stalemate. And I think that that's, you know, really the big story is, you know, what what do all the sides really expect to get out of the war? What is, what is the end state for everybody? Because I think that's becoming the challenging question. You know, if you look at, at what Ukraine, President Zelensky has said, it's retaking all of the territory, including the Donbass, including Crimea. And that, and that is becoming uh, sort, of the, sort of the definition of the extreme, I think, where Russia is, Russia is saying that they're never going to give up Ukraine. It's, it's, tantamount to the United States giving up Hawaii. And, and, then, and then there's questions, very variations on the, on, the, on the theme about how much of Donbass stays with Russia, how much of it, how, how much of it stays with Ukraine. So I think those are kind of the defining uh, limits of, of what, we, what the end states can be. And the United States and Europe are sort of torn between those two. At this point, you know, when you, when you take on the rhetoric of this is defining the global liberal order, then I think there's a tendency to say we have to stick with Ukraine because that's the only way that we can actually sustain the global, the, the global order as it is. And I think that's somewhat dangerous because I think that, that you know, there's a lot of other broader interests that are influencing the United States and the European Union beyond the, the survival of Ukraine as defined by President Zelensky. 
and and as you know, I mean, when you look at at the history of Ukraine, it's not it's not all that well defined. Crimea certainly is not part historically long historically part of, of Ukraine. So so that there has to be some recognition of that 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 boundary is somewhat somewhat flexible. So when you look at what I think matters to the United States and Europe is how long can they sustain the position of supporting Zelensky without trying to probe what a sort what a diplomatic resolution short of the maximal demands that are being made by President Zelensky. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing, I, I, maybe you can speak to how, how this has been in, in previous um, wars, in previous uh, altercations, but I have come to the view that, that uh, Vladimir Putin is not sincere in anything. So when he takes a position, uh, when he tells you what he's going to do, or for that matter, uh, he tells you, um, you know, about a false flag, um, you know, a false flag initiative by some other country like Ukraine. Um, that's that's only for propaganda purposes, um, and that he is he is never really negotiating in good faith. That's that's my view. Just watching him, you know, and, and indeed, you know, the world has that now. You you can never tell whether it's propaganda or good faith negotiation. And I think that uh, on Zelensky's side of it, um, he he's mindful of that. He understands that. So. He's he's not going to negotiate with a guy who is not not sincere, not 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 bona fide, not in good faith. So so you get two layers. I guess maybe this has always happened in Western history. You get two layers. One is uh, the public, you know, for the public consumption, um, where it's just propaganda and it's uh, not not really the position that they would take in a, you know in an honest negotiation. Um, and then you get, you know, the position they would really take if it came down to the crunch. Um, is this something that we only have now or have we always had this? No, it's, I think it's always been that way. And, you know, and, and when you look at when you look at, at you know, past past wars in Europe, you look at World War Two, which, you know, there's a tendency to, to view this war, this war as as similar to World War Two. And. You know, there was this this maximalist demand that you had to eliminate the Nazis and you had to eliminate Hitler totally. It had to be a total a total victory. Uh, you know, other wars haven't been like that. Uh, world War One wasn't like that. And you know, and so maybe maybe World War One is a better example to follow. That that we need to understand that there's going to have to be some compromises because the, that whole Central Europe is is much more in flux than than what. Zelensky is trying to argue publicly, and I think he recognizes that. And and but he wants to maintain, as you say, that that public maximalist position as long as he can. But at some point, I think it, it, it the United States and Europe have to start thinking about what are the long term implications for the larger global order. I mean, it's easy to it's it's easy to say that this this is defining. The, the structure of the of the future global order, but what does that really mean? I mean, what's what's happening in Ukraine now is you have you have in Europe specifically you have rampant inflation from from the dislocations associated with with the energy crisis that's been created by cutting off uh, natural res natural resources from from Russia. And in the United States, it's not the only reason we have inflation, but it certainly is part of the reason why there's inflation in the United States because of because of this this dislocation of resources in in Europe. So I think that that that's one thing we need to look at. The other thing that I think becomes important at some point, especially for the United States in vis-a-vis -vis Russia, is to what extent is Russia prepared to go you know over the nuclear threshold. For, for maintaining its maximalist position. Again, we, we, we hope that there's some, some sh something short of, of a nuclear exchange in Putin's arsenal, that, that in fact, he does recognize that, that going over the nuclear threshold would be dangerous. So again, his maximalist position, at least publicly, is he's willing to do that. But that's, 
that's understandable for, for the public position. So I think th those are the kinds of things that we need to start probing because there's another, the other aspect I should finish on the global order is what impact is this having on, on climate change? Because if there's, a, if there's a global issue that people are tending to start recognizing more and more, it's, it's climate change. And certainly, you know, the, 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 rely, the return to reliance on coal-fired plants in Europe and, and the rest of the world in, 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 in response to the, the increase in prices over other fossil fuels can't be good for climate change. And certainly just, just the, the, the destruction going on in, in Ukraine has to have a negative impact on, on climate change. And, and God forbid that we end up talking about a nuclear exchange of any kind, because that would destroy resources from, from everything from agriculture to, to, to basic living in, in Central Europe. Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> see if you can find the connection that I find, but um, I believe that this sort of thing is, is catching. It's, it's viral, it's infectious. If I am permitted to cross my neighbor's boundary and attack for phony baloney reasons, and just simply because I want it, because I'm an autocrat, because, 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 um, I, and I violate the liberal world order. There are others who will follow, the other autocrats who will move to more extreme positions and try the same thing. And, and, and the comparison I make for you, very current, is Brazil. Um, so this fellow Lula, who is a more left, leftist uh, than Bolsonaro, uh, won the election yesterday, day before. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what, what strikes me so interesting is that the Times and the Washington Post, Post both report that Bolsonaro is he's not agreeing. He's not giving up. He's not, um, you know, he's not agreeing with the result of the election. So where did he get that from? Um, is this all autocrats do this? Or is it kind of a, like a political virus around the world? that you find that more and more uh, leaders who lost the election um, are not agreeing with the election and questioning it. Now we have the same phenomenon that, uh, you know, that Trump initiated here is happening in, in Brazil. And it just shows you that it's monkey see, monkey do. Um, if you see it happening in one place and somebody gets away with it, essentially, uh, then you're going to see it in another place. Um, don't you think there's a beyond climate change, beyond you know profound damage to the environment? There's also profound damage in the sense that these these moves that Putin has made they may be catching. Huh? I, I understand that logic. I understand why why people want to want to see the connection and they have to stop it in its in its tracks. Okay, now what are you going to do? I mean, are you, are you really going to defeat Russia in detail in Ukraine? No, you're not going, you're, 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 you, Russia will exist after Ukraine. And so, so if that's true, then I think it's time to start thinking about what do we really want out of this? Do you want Putin eliminated from power? There's, there's ways to do that short of, of creating a, the elimination of, of Russia. And I think th those are the those are the areas that need to be investigated. That you can't you can't continue to think about it in in absolute zero sum terms. That it's either Russia or Ukraine. That 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 again, taking the maximalist positions on both sides, you have to you have to start figuring out how do you move away from those maximalist positions. Uh, that's the hard yeah. one. That's the, by the way, I don't I don't suggest that it's a it's a it's a lesson for for the United States to look at Bolsonaro and uh, Lula. I'm only saying I, I think the phenomenon is, is um, expressed in that, in that particular election. But, but let, me, let me offer this thought that how can the United States, assuming the United States can, can and will call the shots or want to call the shots uh, for peace, um, how do you go about that when at least one of the two parties is not sincere? So do you go to, and this is a big question, do you go to Zelensky and say, look, you, you've got to make peace. You've got to be the first one of the two of you that actually sits down at the table and, and listens 
and tries to enter into um, some kind of uh, dialogue. And if you don't do that, uh, we're going to be unhappy. We, we insist that you do that. And if we're unhappy, we're going we're to restrict the, the money we give you, the sanctions we impose against Russia, and for that matter, the, the military assistance. So you better do that, thus forcing him. Um, and that puts him at a huge disadvantage at the table. So how do you do it in an equitable way? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it, it, that is a very difficult question. But I'll, I'll turn the question around just a little bit and say Zelensky has to be seeing what's happening in Europe and the United States, where there's, there's a, a growing sense that if the Republicans retake the, the House, that there's going to be a reduction in the amount of support the United States is willing to give. And, you know, and then just as an aside, of course, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had this movement from the from the, the, the far progressive side on the United States where the where the, the 30 the 30 uh, Congress persons brought up the idea of, of reducing the amount of support to to uh, Ukraine. So Zelensky sees this. He also sees the, the protests in in Europe over the high inflation, which is attributed to the Ukraine war. So, you know, so, so it, it puts him in a difficult position to, to take the initiative against someone like Putin. But I think that, that the reality is, is, and I think he sees this reality, that, that he can only maintain this maximalist position for so long. Now, having said that, I think there's also something to be said for, for Moscow, for Putin specifically, to see that, that he is becoming in a different, he's, he's getting to be in a difficult position also because he does have protests in, in Russia. Of course, they're much more contained and we don't really understand the dynamic very well inside Russia of what's happening. But certainly, you know, the, the, uh, the, the recall of 300,000 300, reservists and, you know, and, and, the, and the fleeing of the, of the young, young men from Russia and all this, I'm sure he sees that and he recognizes that he has to move from that maximalist position too. So I'm not suggesting that that Zelensky tomorrow, you know, puts out the advertisement saying, okay, we're ready to give up our maximalist claims. I don't see that happening, but I see that both sides eventually begin to recognize that they do have to do that, that they're going to have to come to some, to some compromise to, to preserve what they value in their position in the international system. Because Ukraine, without, without a vibrant West, is not going to be much to, to want if you're Zelensky. And Putin, on his, on his side, I mean, he has to realize that he's losing public support in Russia. So again, I don't see it, I don't see it as, as the United States trying to force Zelensky into it as much as I want to see the West try to move to Russia and to Ukraine to start working out the compromise solution, to back away from, from the maximalist support for Zelensky without, without any consideration. And so it's not, it's not, it's not that I, I'm asking for Zelensky to move first and to take the, the, the big step, because that's inconsistent with, with large power, small power dynamics, I think. It's hard to stop a war. It, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, which is a, uh, a new movie uh, made of the book and, um, you know, a replay of the old movie, um, which looks at it from the German side uh, and, you know, French warfare. And essentially the trenches were the same throughout, what, four years of war. Um, nobody really moved the needle very much. They just killed each other and, and ultimately killed 17 million people, a lot of people. Um, but what's interesting about it is uh, that, that after the armistice was signed, and in the hour before the armistice was effective, they were still killing each other, knowing mm -hmm. that in an hour's time, um, the armistice would go into effect. Likewise, on the Western Front, which the armistice was principally directed, um, and, uh, you know, the Germans lost, uh, and, and they were humiliated by the French, which was really unnecessary. If you and I were advising the French right now, we'd say, hey, not a good idea to humiliate you know, your enemy. Um, but what, what was happening on the Eastern Front was that the war continued after that armistice. So what you have is a, you know, a complex affair 
with some, um, you know, machine and machines and men and supply lines, um, weapons, uh, all engaged in a war. And it's not so easy to snap your fingers and say, okay, stop now. No, uh, it's not. <laughs> That's right. Well, but and then to make to make the another point there is that, you know, at some point, everybody loses. And I think that's that's the message that needs to be brought out. It's not again, I, I don't want to suggest that that we want to we want to see Zelensky simply cave in to to Russian demands. That's 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 sort of sort of taking the maximalist position and arguing you can't do anything because if you do anything they're they're going to take take everything they can get once you do that and and so it has to be it has to be pressure on both sides now clearly you know it's easier to pressure Zelensky because he's willing to communicate with the west than it is to to convince putin that he has to do something but i think there's you know in in the in this world of of disinformation and and manipulation of the media there certainly are ways to to support the the resistance in russia and to make it more obvious to to Putin that that he is he's losing the 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 role that Russia has and and that brings me to another broader point that I want to make and this certainly concerns the West it concerns Russia and and it concerns the United States and that is the role of China and to me the role of China is important here because they've taken the position of not openly supporting Russia but not not supporting Russia also. So, you know, their, their economic situation is quite different than the West and, and the United States. Specifically, they're in a recession and they're looking for ways to, to, to sort, of, sort of boost their economy. And so this suits them well because they've got resources. They, they, you've seen the numbers. They, they're increasing their, their oil and, and gas in, uh, imports from, from Russia. So they're taking advantage of, of basically lower prices on their on their uh, natural resources and they're and they're not necessarily supporting Russia but they're not trying to defeat Russia either they're not supporting the United States so if if the war ends Russia benefits if the war continues China still benefits because because they they are the ones that are are, are basically taking advantage of there, if, if you want to see the country that's taking advantage of, of the situation, it really is China because they're they're promoting their their global security initiative, which you know says that that uh, security is inviolable, which of course is nonsense because it's inviolable, but it has to be inviolable from a point of time, and 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 you know this this whole idea was promoted by Russia to prevent the expansion of NATO, and now China is simply picking it up. Saying, saying security is inviolable. Well, it's inviolable unless a major country invades a smaller country. Then, then it's not inviolable because it, it, so it's it's kind of a nonsensical kind of kind of conceptualization about about security. But but in the meantime, China is taking advantage of that, and China is certainly taking advantage of of the diminishment of the United States and and the European Union in terms of, of economic clout in the rest of the world. So while the, Euro the European Union and the United States are very strongly opposed to the war in Ukraine, there's a, there's a whole swath of countries that are much more ambivalent about it. And they are, they are receiving support from, from China as, as a way to bolster China's image in the rest of the world. So they're coming across as looking like the, the, the more, more, more stable power for the long term, mm, so I think another, that that's another way they take advantage. It's another it's way, another they, way take... They, they they take advantage of, of the situation. They're not they're 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 very opportunistic in doing that. So by by maintaining that neutral position, they're they're in a they're in a position to win either way. So they've they've got both sides covered. So let's talk about uh, those who would um, inter intercede, those who would um, become mediators, negotiators, what have you. I think uh, you know there was some discussion a, a few months ago about how Israel might do that, it, but it, that stopped. That didn't happen. It isn't happening. Um, and then there's Trump. Trump uh, said he would he would go and he would be a mediator. Uh, my reaction is lots of luck. Uh, the guy who foments the divisiveness is going to uh, mediate a dispute. Not a chance. Uh, and then there's the uh, most most recently Elon Musk uh, has a has a plan. Uh, you wonder about the Logan Act, you know, whether somebody can 
do this sort of thing. You know, if you and I decided to do it, I, I think we'd have we'd be meeting the United States attorney. Uh, <laughs> so my question to you is, you know, who in this play, this this big theater, this global theater of powers and individuals who claim to be powerful, who can step up and say, now, now, boys, this is destroying the environment, this is destroying the liberal world order. It is not really in anybody's best interest except China. <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't you stop already? Well, I don't think I don't think anybody is really in that position, quite honestly. Uh, the United States, I don't think it's. I mean, quite quite frankly, this is this is a sort, somewhat of a reflection of the, of the loss of of capacity for the United States to actually dictate terms of, of agreement and, and disagreement at the global level. Uh, you know, one, one other person that you didn't name who's actually had quite a bit of influence is Recep Erdogan, of course, you know, the, the Turkish prime minister. He's, he's actually the one who's been involved in, in negotiating the, the, the grain deal and has, has worked with, uh, with uh, Russia and, and Ukraine to, to sort of sell weapons that, that benefit him, but actually Turkey has played probably as big of a role as anybody. And of course, you know, the other one that's, that's claimed to try to play a, an intermediary role is, is Jokowi from Indonesia in, in the context mostly of, of hosting the G20 uh, in a couple of weeks here. But, you know, so, so there's several people who can, who can play at the margins of this thing, but ultimately it, it is, it, is uh, it has to be a combination of, of players that come to the realization that this really is a, a losing game. And as long as China is in the position they are, it's going to be very difficult to get that coalition together because there's, there's people, I mean, like India, for example, and, and, and the South American country, Brazil, for example, it'll be interesting to see how they play now that, now that Lula is apparently the, the new president. But as you say, Bolsonaro, my understanding is Bolsonaro hasn't really said anything yet, but we anticipate that he will come out fairly soon and 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 resist the the election. So you know, so you've got these 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 sort of large middle powers, if you will, that that can play a role and they can they can certainly influence how it comes out. But then the question is, is who leads that? Can can you really put together a coalition from the United States, the European Union, and some of these other large players like India and and maybe maybe Brazil to come together to to work something out? I mean, that's, that's probably the best hope because I don't see the United States and China coming to the point where they mutually recognize the vulnerabilities that are associated with, with this, this disruption in, in, in the global ecosystem. Neither of us have mentioned the United, uh, the United Nations, um, which I think this is another demonstration of, of the failure of that system uh, because of the Security Council rule and the veto procedure and so forth. Um, and it, it can't be a, a vessel in which this, this collaboration can take place. It is, it is um, futile. And um, that is very sad. Um, and, and I think what all of this proves up, you know, you have war crimes going on, they can't stop the war crimes. Invasion of a neighbor, all this brutality, they can't stop it. They're, they have no voice. They have no leverage, no power, no nothing. Um, and what, what it demonstrates, I think, is the United Nations. Carl, the United Nations is finished. It's finished in modern times. Well, I, I mean, yeah, if, we, if it would be so easy, uh, finishing the United Nations is about as, finish, about as easy as finishing a war. Uh, you know, once a bureaucracy, <laughs> once a bureaucracy is in place, trying to, trying to unseat it is, is about as futile as... Uh, as, as trying to pursue a, a meaningful end to war. And, and so, yeah, but I mean, practically, practically speaking, you, you're right. I mean, they, I mean, I wanna, I wanna acknowledge that they were part of the, part of the grain uh, movement negotiation, but it, was, it wasn't, they weren't the main players in that negotiation. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so they, they've, they've demonstrated that, that the, the whole concept behind the Security Council with a single power veto isn't going to work because there's always going to be the single power that is being the aggressor. Well, you worry about Europe. Uh, there was a piece in the paper about uh, Germany and Olaf uh, Scholz. Um, 
<clears throat> about he was uh, holding back. <clears throat> he was holding back on money and weapons uh, that they thought he was going to give Ukraine. And there's, um, you know, issues about Italy, not clear what's going to happen uh, with Maloney. And finally, <clears throat> you know, uh, when, when they have another election in France, nobody knows what's going to happen there. And the UK is in trouble, you know, economically and yeah. politically for that matter. And yeah. so, you know, the EU is not the same as it was, you know, 60 days ago. Uh, it's really interesting. <clears throat> and, and then, of course, the United States is facing this election, which, as you mentioned, I think is a great concern. The Republicans get into office, especially in the money, in the money house, <clears throat> and uh, they'll stop the money. And, uh, you know, we actually had a double cheese pizza bet on one of our other shows. And I bet that as soon as the Republicans got into office, they would stop the money. Uh, the other guy said, no, no, no. People in this country believe in the liberal world order. Do they really? Uh, yeah. And they believe in you. They want to support Ukraine. They do. I think they're more interested in, 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 in the gas price and, and the cost of a, 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 you know, a, a, a dozen eggs. Um, and they don't think about this at all. And the media does not The media does not really push the point. You have much more of distraction news from Trump and his friends uh, than you do about Ukraine. So I think the U.S. is moving more into isolationism and away from you know creating a collaboration with Europe. And so all of this is you know is going to happen in in two weeks' time. Um, all of this is going to come together because if the U.S. starts backing off. The rest of those guys, they're going to see an opportunistic, op, you know, an opportunity also um, get, get out of town and, uh, and force Zelensky to relent. Um, what do you think the timing is on all of that? Because it's not a happy thought. It, it's not. And I'm thinking, you know, I mean, we, we, we had this discussion early on when we started talking about Ukraine, that ultimately for the West, it was going to come down to an economic problem. And, and I think it has. And so, and so how long can, can Europe sustain the inflation? I mean, you saw the CPI numbers today, they were, they were up again, up 10, 10 something percent. You know, and, and, and clearly there's a lot of frustration building in, in all the democracies in Europe over, over the inflation. And the United States, you've, you've seen the news, the, we don't care about abortion. We don't care about uh, about uh, human rights. What we care about is gas prices, the economy, and so you know it's coming back to to where we anticipated it would. That it's it's how long can the West sustain its commitment to supporting Zelensky and and the, the current Ukraine? And I think I, I put it put a timeline on it a year because a year from now I think that, that the, the, the Europeans and the Americans are going to be very weary of, of doing blank checks to, to Ukraine. I mean, that's, you can see that in the last couple of tranches. I mean, there's, there's, there's political advertisements out today on the news, on the television that says, What's it, what has Biden done? He's given X number to, to Ukraine instead of, instead of something, you know? And so, yeah, so I think that, 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 that it's going to be an economic issue and, I'm going to I'm going to say a year and in a year we need to start seeing something more than just uh, we're going to support the, the maximalist position of, of Zelensky and Ukraine. And, yep. and if we can if we can move Russia in that direction, and that's why I think it's important that we start moving, moving to figure out how to how to have Russia engage in a meaningful way in that in that discussion with Ukraine. And, and I think the way that's done is that you start showing Putin and you start showing the Russian people that, you know, the cost of you pursuing your maximalist position is you become a vassal state to a large neighbor without specifying a name. <laughs> I hope he's persuadable. I think right now he's playing the time game. I think he, he is too. He's push, he's, he, he knows everything that you and I are saying. In fact, he may be watching this show right now, Carl, and learning from it. Sorry to say, yeah. <laughs> you never know. But but I, I would I would um, I would say that when you say one year um, from now this will all crystallize somehow, um, that's before twenty twenty four, and yeah. twenty twenty four is the uh, you know it's the big the big rendezvous, 
And so I think the Republicans, in order to assure greater success in the next election, the presidential year, um, will be you know, complaining about Biden and his lack of success in organizing you know, a, a group of nations that will support Ukraine. And they'll just call it another failure like Afghanistan um, that, le- that lays at Biden's door. Even though in withdrawing you know, the, um, the money, which they will do, I think, uh, and we, we're not having a pizza about that. No pizza bet on that. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I wouldn't take your I wouldn't take your money. You wouldn't take <laughs> pizza. <laughs> but you know, I, I think that they're they're, they're going to blame Biden, and they're going to use that in the 2024 elections, and um, that that's very handy for the Republicans. It's all easy, easy uh, political power, um, and so if the United States drops out, uh, Europe doesn't have the glue. To stay together, and this is all pulling the rug out from Zelensky. So, how how do you see this unfolding in terms of the territory involved? I, you know, you and I have been talking about the Donbas since we originally started this conversation. Uh, uh, do you think do you think now that Zelensky will have to give it up, and do you think that Putin wants that and will stop there? I, yes, I do. I think. I, I, and, and again, I mean, to, to say that, that Putin will stop there gives me a bit of a pause because your, your point is taken that, that it's hard to say that he's going to really be satisfied, but he may recognize that as at least an inter- intermediate win. And I think that, that that may be what he wants to get at this point, because I think he also recognizes his vulnerabilities. And so I think I think that that's ultimately what he would accept at this point. And then it's just a question of where that blurry line exists. If it's the entire of 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 Donetsk and and Luhansk, or if it's a portion of 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 that of that region, you know, the the one that the ones that have have, have always been sort of occupied by Russian Russian friendly uh, people and 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 politicians, and and certainly uh, uh, Crimea is not on the table as far as uh, Putin is concerned, that that, that that will remain Russian. So I think that that, that, that would be something that, that Putin would accept as, as a, a workable solution for at least the intermediate term. You're right about the intermediate term, because who knows what happens a day yeah. later? Who, who knows what happens the day after the agreement is made? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think I think it it continues, but it, it will be it, it won't be an outright war where we're actually taking down, you know, the the electrical grid in Kiev anymore. But it will be, you know, it will be that the same festering conflict that we've had for for decades now yeah. in, in the Donbas region. Yeah, asymmetrical, you yeah. know, a hacking attack here and a phony baloney uh, election there and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, it's in it's it's probably. It, at least, at least in the lifetime of Putin, it's probably in the interest of Russia to continue to harass Ukraine, even even after after some peace agreement. And I think I think that's that, that we have to accept that as a fact. And so and so the, the conditions of the of the peace agreement or the peace settlement are are going to have to recognize and acknowledge that 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 Ukraine will always have to maintain a strong military. And then, of course, you know, then then the, the real questions that come up then. Is how do you rebuild Ukraine? You know, how do you how do you actually rebuild that economy after being devastated by Russia? Because certainly Russia is not going to be in a position itself to do that. I mean, if you know, if if in in Russian's fantasy somehow you bring Ukraine collapsed, Russia would not be in a position to rebuild Ukraine. You know, you oh. would have to rely on some other some other outside source to actually do that. Western Europe would have to step up for a trillion dollars. That's that's a number, yeah. I mean, and it's probably it's probably a low number, if, yeah. you know, if I understand what's happening correctly. What about um, you know allowing Ukraine the remainder of it um, to ha- have some kind of angle on becoming a member of the EU? I think NATO would probably not work, but maybe uh, some kind of associate associate membership in EU. 
yeah, I mean, it, to the extent that that's going to be advantageous, you know, I mean, that's a, that's <laughs> right. maybe an open question. But I think, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that would be one of the, you know, one of the points that that Zelensky would try to would try and and legitimately we should support try to push is is to to allow the rest of Ukraine to actually align with the West in terms of their economic well-being. You know, Carl, we started out with the notion in this discussion with the notion that it, it's hard to break, predict anything these mm -hmm. days, uh, not only in this country, um, but globally and certainly in, in Ukraine. And um, you know, I, 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 I come away from the discussion with the feeling that, yes, we have, we have talked about some of the important vectors that have appeared. Some of the influences and you know, what we call configurations around the world that will affect this, but um, it's impossible to identify them all. I mean, for example, we could have uh, a an escalation in climate change that would really start destroying things all around the world. We could have we could have the the nuclear conflagration uh, that Putin has referred to, and God knows where that would take us. So our discussion is it's all very rational. And you could defend any of the, you know, the expectations we have identified, but but how confident are you uh, that we that we could actually predict what's going to happen here? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, we can't because you don't you you know it, it's an old saying from from Clausewitz that says war is very difficult to predict and it's impossible to control because it's it's ultimately chaos and so you've created chaos. Now, now you have to accept that the, the, the outcomes are unknown at this point. And I think they remain so for the, for the reasons you say. There are so many outside variables that can intervene and, and throw us on an entirely different course. Yeah, the one thing that seems sure is the chaos and the killing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, always people step in and say, well, this is crazy. Our, our young people are going into the mouth of, of, of a cannon. Uh, they're going to be killed in large numbers. And only then do we learn. We learn the hard way. We, all sides, learn the yeah. hard way. And yeah. that may be what happens here, don't you think? I, I do. I mean, I think that's what I say. I don't, I, don't see, I don't see us demanding that Zelensky enter into negotiation. It's going to be something that, that forces him and Putin into, into thinking about how do you, how do you end this in, in, a, in a way that at least salvages something. Well, with us, it's easy. We're out of time, so we have to end it. And I, I'm, I'm very glad that I, I never made that double cheese bet with you. But I, I, look, forward, I look forward to our next discussion, um, possibly about the uh, global economy. Uh, as soon as you have a chance, uh, I'd like to circle back on that, Carl. Okay, sure. Sounds good. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.